At a room in a hospital for the terminally ill, there were two gentlemen. They shared this room. They did not know each other before they were admitted to this hospital. But as it is the case for people when they are put together, when they are faced with similar challenges, they started a relationship. So they started to talk about their lives, their jobs, their families, the places that they went to, their triumphs, their failures. They became friends. This room had one window. So one of the gentlemen had his bed next to that window. And every day, at around noon, the nurse would come and sit that gentleman up to drain the fluids from his lungs. And that would be the time where he will be looking through the window. It just so happened that this window was overseeing a beautiful lake. I want you to imagine that lake. It's so serene, so calm, that the rays of the sun was reflecting over its surface as they reflect over a silver mirror. There were things happening every day at that lake, and the gentleman next to the window used to narrate what is happening outside to his friend. This time at noon became a cherished time. They both waited for it. And the gentleman next to the window used to tell these stories about the parades that are going around, the music that's going around, the, uh, the beautiful and colorful balloons, the children that they are playing, the lovers strolling hand in hand, the happiness, the beauty. And the, the other person who's inside, even when he cannot hear the music, he can imagine the music in his, in his head. He could actually see the vivid colors of the colorful balloons as his friend tells him about what's happening out there. It became an oasis of normalcy in, in the midst of this pain and tubes and, and, and medicine and bitterness and so on. One day, the nurse came in the morning and she was checking on the gentleman next to the window and he was dead. Now, that was expected. They were both terminally ill. But they felt very sad nonetheless. Anyway, the other person, and as soon as it was appropriate, he called the nurse and said, Nurse, could you please move my bed next to the window? And indeed, his request was granted. At around noon that day, with a lot of pain, this gentleman managed to sit up. And he looked through the window. And to his surprise, there was a wall. So he called the nurse and said, Nurse, when did you erect this wall? She said, this wall has always been there. Then he, he was puzzled. He said, but the gentleman, he was telling me all these beautiful stories about whatever is happening out there. She said, do you mean you did not know that he was blind? Now, maybe some of you have heard this story, and that's not the point. The point that I'm trying to make is, while I was narrating the story, I was feeding you words. Your brain has used my words to build a world inside your head. I bet when I was talking about the balloons, you imagined balloons in your head. Different balloons nonetheless, but you have created, each and every one of you has created the world inside your head. And this is actually the power of stories. Probably the one thing that differentiates us from other creatures on this earth is our ability to tell, believe, and create stories. Stories are so important, and they are an essential part of who we are as individuals, as communities, as companies and organizations, and as even as nations. So, 
the, our mind and our brain has many uh, purposes and jobs. Well, one of them is to tell stories about who we are and stories about how the world works. We know now for a fact that this narrative happens in the left side of our brain. Now, there is another thing that is being recognized, which is these stories that we tell are actually powered by the language that we use. These stories that we tell are powered by the words that we opt to use. And there is even a more powerful thing, which is these stories that we tell can actually lead to the behaviors that we exhibit. They lead to the way we manage ourselves. They lead to the way we manage our relationships. Now, why is this very important and why is it very powerful? There are a number of reasons. So if someone is trying to influence you, let's say an advertiser, they will be feeding you with pictures and words that will make you create a story in your head. And the story is, I need this product. I need to buy this product. And this is indeed the way to influence people. So that's the first one. The second thing which is very important, most of the change programs focus on the top part. We want to immediately change behavior. The easiest way to change behavior is to either reward or punish. But without changing the stories that are being told within individuals, within families, organizations, or even nations, you will never have lasting change. The lasting change can happen only when you change the stories that are told. Now, this can happen both in a positive way and also in a negative way. So let me give you some examples. You know the uh, Nazis during the Holocaust, they used to call the Jews rats. So that's the language. And that led to narrative and rhetoric in the media and within, you know, the, uh, even the intellectual uh, people that the Jews are cost causing uh, the Germans all this uh, economic trouble and so on. And that only when the, the story was changed, the genocide the, was, was um, you know, enabled. This was repeated again and again whenever we had a case of genocide or a case of enslaving, people enslaving other people. So even in Rwanda, the uh, uh, Hutus used to call the Tutsi cockroaches. And only then, you know, you change the stories about them. And after that, the, uh, you know, the genocide can take place. Now, we are actually not uh, helpless in this process as, as human beings. There's something that we can do about it. And that thing is, when we choose to be aware of the stories that we are telling, and when we choose to have awareness of these stories. That awareness and that examination of the stories that we tell is called emotional intelligence. And the reason I put it in this way is I think our existence happens almost like, a, like an iceberg. The part that you see of it is the regulation and the behavior part, but underneath it there is the language layer and there is the story layer, and there is the awareness layer. This is the language, the narrative, the awareness, and regulation is how we exist and how we can have more lasting change. The top two layers, the awareness and the regulation, is called emotional intelligence. And one of the people who worked a lot on this is uh, Daniel Goldman, and he developed the emotional intelligence model that you can see on the slide. Now, why is this important? It's important for a number of reasons. First, we know now for a fact that we are happy, healthy, and successful when we have good relationships with the people around us. So that's number one. And relationship management is the pinnacle of emotional intelligence. 
Now, while this is happening, we look at what's going on in the world, and, we, and there, it's a fact that mental illness is becoming a big issue, suicide is becoming a big issue. As a matter of fact, WHO is predicting that by 2030, if nothing is done, depression is going to be number one illness in the world. So we need to do something about that. At the same time, empathy is actually dropping among, let's say, uh, undergraduate students. And this is, again, being very well documented. This is happening at a time where we are becoming, uh, we are building technology that is better than us physically, better than us, uh, than us even cognitively, and most likely the jobs of the future are going to require the final domain in which humans are superior to the machine, which is the emotional intelligence. So we need to do something about that. So we need emotional intelligence to be happy, we need it to remain healthy, probably we need it to remain employed. But we are having issues with our mental health, issues with our relationships, and um, other issues with uh, emotional intelligence. I decided to do something about that. I started a massive open online course to teach emotional intelligence. And all I wanted my students to do is to do very simple exercises. I asked them to change their language and utilize more positive language. I also asked them to show gratitude to each other and to other people. I asked them to mention the five things that they are grateful for on a daily basis. None of this I created, but I put it together in a course and I made it, I put structure around it and I gamified it and I encouraged students when they did it. I'll show you some of the examples that has been achieved. So this is one of my students, Luis Esteban. He always wanted to climb a mountain, but he couldn't do it in, the, in, in a number of trials. And after he took the course, and because one of the requirements of the course is that you remove the P word, and the P word is the word P-R-O-B-L-E-M, I can't pronounce it because I removed it from my language, he needs to replace it with the word opportunity. And because of this, he was able to finally climb the mountain. He took that note with him saying, say no to the P word. This has been used even at companies, and Robert is a CEO of a small technology company in, in, in the United States, and when he does brainstorming with his staff, he asks them to never mention the P word, but replace it with the word challenge or opportunity, and that forces them sort of to reframe their thinking and come up with very effective solutions. I took this actually even to the, to the physical uh, domain. So these people you see on the picture are the member of the executive team of my university, and they're all pledged not to use the P word. Not only that, we actually pledge that every time we mention the P word, we are going to put one ringgit in a pot, and we will give that money eventually to the to charity. We call that the Opportunity Fund. Now, in my university, we are trying to teach our students, our lecturers, our staff, emotional intelligence. And we are using storytelling to do that. We are taking any opportunity to actually create a resilient, empathetic, and happy community. This picture was taken of me cleaning the toilets in my university on the uh, world, uh, world Toilet Day just last week. And the idea was for us to be empathetic and appreciative of our janitors, we will do their work for a day. This was only one of the exercises, but we done we did other things in which the students also participated. So, for example, different groups of staff and students adopted different toilets, they cleaned them, they put flowers in them, and then we picked the best toilet. So I believe that emotional intelligence is very important. I think it needs to be taught, 
and I think it can be taught. I think my course have shown this. I also believe that in order for us to do this, we will need to change our language, our stories, create awareness, only then we, cha we can change our behavior. This is one of my favorite proverb. Those who tell the stories rule the world. I believe that life is a story that we tell in our heads. I would like you to use the most positive language to tell the most impactful and powerful story so that may, you may lead an amazing and happy life. Dream big, be different, and have fun.